Shinji Iwai is a writer and director who has been working in film since 1888, with his career beginning in short films and TV movies. Similar to Hirokazu Koreeda, Iwai moved on to feature-length films with 1994's Undo, and continuing until the present with a number of quirky oddball films which run the gamut in terms of tone, themes, and genre. A year after this feature debut, EY released Love Letter. This was truly the first in a long string of critical and commercial successes for the burgeoning director. Throughout his career, EY has also worked with a number of influential figures in Japanese cinema. Whether it was directing a documentary on the life of Kon Ichikawa, the man behind Fires on the Plain and Tokyo Olympiad, or appearing in the film Ritual Day, directed by Hideaki Anno, most well known as the creator of the Evangelion franchise and 2016's Shin Godzilla. A man with a diverse repertoire, Iwai's works all have one thing in common, and that's the introspective nature of his storytelling. Iwai stated in an interview with the South China Morning Post that he doesn't actually consume much artistically in the way of books or films making him something of an outsider as a director. This may, in fact, account for the unique and relatable quality that his films possess, as his narrative style is largely untouched by the influence of popular media. Love Letter is no exception to this. For those in the English-speaking world interested in Love Letter, there's both good news and bad news. Fine Line Features, the company which released Love Letter in the US, became a part of New Line in 2005, which in turn became part of Warner Home Video in 2010. Why is that important? Well, because if you're looking for a Region 1 copy on DVD, it simply doesn't exist. We can't find any evidence of it being released in the US on VHS, with the only release date from Fine Line being a theatrical run back in the day. For this reason, your best bet if you're interested is to get a region-free Korean copy that has English subtitles included. These copies are fairly inexpensive, meaning you won't be breaking the bank to open this love letter. Love Letter revolves around Hiroko Watanabe, the survivor of her fiancé, Itsuki Fuji. After having a memorial service for the man who died several years back while in a snowbound hiking expedition with friends, Hiroko pays a visit to Itsuki's mother. Miss Fuji tells Hiroko that the house in which Itsuki grew up has long since been demolished to make room for a highway, but Hiroko jots down the old address and composes a letter to her fiancé and mails it to the address asking simply, how are you? As fate would have it, the letter is delivered to Itsuki Fuji, only this is a woman with the same name as the deceased fiancé. The film then explores the fledgling relationship between these two women. As it turns out, female Itsuki knew Hiroko's Itsuki growing up. Not only that though, the two almost had a romantic relationship in their teenage years. The film is thus played out half in the present, as Hiroko learns more about her almost husband than she did in life, and half in a flashback to a time when the two Itsuki's paths crossed time and again in a way that left an everlasting impression. It's in the subtleties and the visual cues in this section of the film that we begin to sense that Perhaps, Hiroko's fiancé was in love with this other Itsuki at a younger age, and potentially, as scenes like the track meet show, she reciprocated these feelings. We're not alone, as Hiroko's suspicions also seem to wax and wane at this point. We're also treated to some of the prettiest parts of the film. Cinematographer Noboro Shinoda worked with Iwai on all of his feature films before passing away in June of 2004 due to liver failure at the age of 52. Makoto Shinkai, the man behind 5 centimeters per second, The Garden of Words, Your Name, and Weathering With You, specifically name-dropped Iwai in an interview when asked about visual influence, commenting that Iwai shoots beautiful scenery, and if you've seen any of Shinkai's works, you probably know that he has an eye for beauty. As is true of all the collaborations between Iwai and Shinoda, Love Letter is a very well-shot film. This is most obvious with the wide shots used throughout the flashbacks, involving scenes which appear to only contain one or two characters, but as the frame expands, show that we've merely been seeing a small part of the picture. 
This is to say nothing of the superb acting in Love Letter. The film stars Miho Nakayama, a singer popular in the 80s and early 90s, whose previous appearances included 1986's manga-adapted Bebop High School and a digital representation in one of the first dating sims, Miho Nakayama no Tokimeki High School. This little oddity was developed by Hirokobu Sakaguchi, the creator of Final Fantasy, and Yoshio Sakamoto of Metroid fame, with music by Nobuo Uematsu, the man who essentially gave Final Fantasy its sound for the first 15 years of its existence. Following its Japanese release, Love Letter went on to garner nominations for Best Film, Best Supporting Actor for Etsushi Toyokawa, and Best Score at the Japanese Academy Awards in 1996. Iwai explained in an interview with John Wheeler for the University of Southern California that his writing process involves a heavy dose of memory, wanting to create something that is so emotionally and visually striking that it remains with the viewer for a long time after the actual act of viewing one of his films has ended. He handpicks the portions of his scripts that he can remember in between editing drafts, and simply does away with anything that isn't notable. It seems only appropriate, then, that his breakthrough film concerned memory so greatly in a story about grief and human interaction. This is notable both for how striking Love Letter is visually, and how this sentiment relates to the characterization of the male Itsuki, Fuji, in the film. Love Letter is centered almost entirely around a character that we see only through one of the main character's eyes. The late Itsuki Fuji is referred to through anecdote by many others, whether they were classmates, hiking buddies, or family, and yet Hiroko herself only ever offers one piece of information about him, that being that he didn't propose to her, and rather that she was the one to propose to him. There's a concept in fiction called the audience proxy, which is essentially a character who is typically an outsider to the situation presented in the work. This is done because it's far easier to present an unfamiliar situation to an audience by having things explained to a character in-universe who is him or herself otherwise unfamiliar with the situation. Audience proxies are your Frodo's and your Luke Skywalker's. They save the author of a given work the stress of explaining a world in a way that would feel unnatural to someone living inside of it. If Luke already had a concept of the galaxy beyond his home planet, besides his own boyish dreams and assumptions, he wouldn't be able to experience the thrills of exploring said galaxy, with a band of misfits more experienced and willing to show him the ropes. Thus, as Luke learns the rules and mechanics of the universe he inhabits, so do we. Through an audience proxy, the audience can also more easily project onto one character's confusion and excitement at the wonder of the world presented within a story, and thus can become more engaged. In Love Letter, where the world isn't so foreign, an audience proxy might seem like an unnecessary component. However, it's in realizing that Hiroko is an audience proxy that we learn how little she knew about her fiancé. We're never told explicitly how long Fuji and Hiroko knew one another prior to his death nor how long they were engaged. We don't know how deep the relationship was, as she only ever provides that one piece of information on it. Information which may be argued to show either that he had retained his boyish standoffishness, or that they simply had not been together too terribly long, as it could be said that two people who have known each other longer than a few months or years should know a little about one another's pasts. So with every other character knowing Fuji in a deeper, or at least a different way than Hiroko, Iwai is using her character's ignorance so that we are able to learn about a character that is integral to the story, yet not present, at least as an adult. It's this simple device, so well beloved by many an author, that helps us to grow with Hiroko. Akiba initially seems as though he might be a slimeball, swooping in to pick up the bereaved widow, but he also provides valuable information about Fuji and more than one experience that ultimately helps Hiroko overcome her process of grieving. Itsuki appears at first glance to be a somewhat bumbling, albeit charming Claude, who hasn't done much maturing since her school days, but through her letter writing and working through of these forgotten memories, she is able to mature and help Hiroko grieve. Despite not being much of a reader, Shinji Iwai has stated that the film is inspired by Haruki Murakami's novel Norwegian Wood, a tale of nostalgia, loss, and grief, 
One of Murakami's better-known works, it centers around a love triangle involving two women who both know only half of the male narrator's personality. With each of them, he shares roughly half of his memories. There are a number of parallels between the works. The book, however, chronicles the past events of their lives together through the man's viewpoint, where Love Letter gives us the view of the two women. It's an interesting shift in dynamic if this type of story interests you. If you haven't checked it out and liked Love Letter, we would highly recommend it. In an interview with Film Comment, Iwai elaborated on the themes he might have borrowed from Norwegian Wood by saying, quote, in my stories, the most important thing is we don't know each other. It's hard to understand even your partner. Sometimes people think of their partner. It's mine. She's mine. He's mine. Everything. I'm him. I'm her. That's what Hiroko thought when she loses her partner. And then she finds another woman's letters. And she gradually sees memories she never knew. It's a way of seeing her fiancé again. End quote. While this outlook on the individual as she relates socially to others would appear time and again for EY through A Bride for Rip Van Winkle, All About Lily Shushu, and others, it's directly important in Love Letter. The memories these women share are the most powerful bond they could hope for. Like the former classmates of Fuji that we meet in his hometown early on, we as an audience aren't particularly saddened by Fuji's death. We barely know the guy, and our perception of him is built from other people's memories. Instead, we are saddened by the impact that his death has on the other characters, particularly Hiroko, with whom we travel as she learns more about him. This is where the true brilliance of the writing shows through. Shinji Iwai in Love Letter has built a character only through the words of others. The event of his death is the happenstance that sets off the events of the narrative. But Hiroko isn't interested in the physical remains of Fuji. When she visits his room in the beginning of the film, despite the presence of so many of his possessions, she doesn't take anything with her except an idea. The address to a house that no longer exists, according to the words of Fuji's mother. From the beginning, Hiroko is more interested in the memory, the idea of Fuji, as she remembers him. This is why, when she receives a response to her letter, Hiroko feels both elated and let down. Prior to receiving the blown up driver's license photo, why couldn't the person responding be her deceased fiancé? She lives in a fantasy for this short time, before being forced to confront, through the help of both Itsuki with her letters and Akiba with his two pilgrimages, that her fiancé is in fact dead and that perhaps he wasn't who she remembered him to be. Hiroko learns all that she can about him from others, and then must close this chapter of her life. Her grief must end, and she must move on, which is why she sends all of the memories back to Itsuki. Hiroko was merely borrowing them to learn, but decides to remember him on her own terms, the strongest decision anyone could make. It's also why she concludes her journey by trying desperately to speak with the man she thinks she loved exactly because she knows that this time, she will receive no response. She sends her letter to the dead, only to hear her own voice echo back from the chasm between heaven and earth. For this scene alone, Love Letter remains an emotionally affecting, deeply truthful take on loss. We see Hiroko dipping her toes into this fantastical world where her fiancé never passed on, and then exploring his life before her once the reality sets in. This series of events and interactions is then capped off by her and their greatest mutual friend coming to terms with the raw reality that Itsuki Fuji is in fact gone. His memories remain, and it's up to each individual who knew him to interpret these memories. Itsuki Fuji may have had his own story, but it's now the duty of others to remember and to tell it. Any way you slice it, Love Letter is a beautiful movie. It's beautifully written, with gorgeous music, and top-notch photography that really makes you wonder how many different ways this guy could film snow and still make it look unique. It's a shame that the movie isn't available in the US on DVD or Blu-ray, but thankfully it's easy enough to acquire an English subtitled version. Let us know in the comments below what you think of Love Letter, and which of Shunji Iwai's films are your favorites. 